So, hello everybody. Welcome to the How the Hive Came to Be webinar series. Today we have the third session, Cilium as an eBPF use case done by Joe, Joe Stringer from iSurveillant. This is, as mentioned, the third session. If you're interested in the other two sessions, check out iSurveillant.com slash events where, we, uh, where you will find links to the other two sessions. And having said that, I'll now hand over to Joe. Joe, thanks for being with us today and take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Roland. Yeah, so um, today we're gonna uh, discuss uh, Cilium as a, a use case for eBPF and, and how eBPF enables us to uh, build high performance uh, networking platform uh, for cloud native use cases um, that uh, also achieves like deep visibility of things that we just couldn't do without uh, eBPF being there. So before we uh, kick off, a little bit of housekeeping and uh, logistics. Uh, so you will be uh, muted when you when you join. Um, feel free to ask your questions in the in the Zoom chat. Uh, we'll uh, try to answer those questions as we come to it, and at the end we'll have uh, some some time for some Q and A. Uh, and the recording of this session will be made available uh, after the webinar, and it'll be emailed to all of you. Uh, so briefly, just to introduce myself. So I'm a Cilium co maintainer. Uh, I'm a member of the eBPF steering committee, which is the technical steering committee for the eBPF community. Uh, and I'm also a software engineer at iSurveillant. So the agenda for today, uh, I do wanna briefly uh, go into an excursion into wider trends in the industry in terms of container networking uh, and uh, Kubernetes and, and, um, and eBPF to kind of lay some groundwork of, of uh, some of the, the things that are useful to know when we look at some of the use cases that Cilium tries to solve. Uh, and then we'll look at Cilium in particular uh, from three angles, uh, networking and security and observability. So for each of these uh, cases, then we'll take a bit of a look at how eBPF allows us to rethink the way that we're solving problems in these spaces. Uh, and then how, do, how does eBPF make Cilium fundamentally better as a data plane in, in these cloud native environments? Uh, and you'll notice a, a little bit of a trend here, which is that, uh, eBPF requires, uh, basically allows us to take radically different approaches to solving these problems. Uh, and so if we contrast that with the, the uh, kind of environments that we've seen before, uh, you know, the performance or the, the visibility and so on that we, that we had with previous tools was kind of mostly good enough. Um, this is uh, one of the IP tables uh, maintainers mentioning this, uh, and they're saying that, you know, there needs to be a radically different approach to solve some of these problems. And it's, it's great to see that happening. So in, in general, what we're, what we're seeing is in um, sort of cloud native and, and you know, service mesh and so on is we're kind of moving away from this uh, relatively uh, kind of smaller or, or less dynamic environments. Uh, we have typically got like uh, VMs and a vSwitch that define networking behavior and define the security behavior in your uh, environment to these more ephemeral uh, environments where things are changing all the time. Uh, things are based on containers or, or cloud functions and so on. Uh, and so as the as this change occurs, what we see is that the scale uh, changes and and we need to reevaluate the assumptions that we've made about how we build networking primitives uh, so that we can keep up with that innovation that's that's occurring. Um, so yeah, and uh, eBPF is a, a key part of this. And so what EP, eBPF is allowing us to do is attach uh, some logic to events that are happening at various different places uh, in the system. And, um, and and this is quite important because depending on how often these events occur and how much work you do based on these events, you can drastically impact the way that uh, your application behaves. Um, so if there's uh, too many events going on in the system, um, then you're you're spending CPU cycles on those events uh, when you could be spending them on on workloads. Or if you're the the work that you're actually doing when these events occurs uh, to implement networking and security and observability uh, functionality. Uh, if we're doing too much work because it's it's inefficient, uh, then again, that's that's lost cycles that you could spend on on other events. Um, so, and as we go through the the following set of use cases, you'll notice a bit of a pattern emerging um, around how the previous uh, systems that you might have used to build technology like this in the past were either uh, too constrained around how you can customize the behavior of the Linux kernel and and uh, implement this uh, uh, solutions to these problems. Um, or, or the work that was performing, being performed against these events uh, was done in, a, in an inefficient manner. And so we'll see how various different attachment points can, can be used to, to improve this. So um, the first area that I wanted to focus on is, is around networking. 
So in, in a Kubernetes cluster, you typically have quite uh, ephemeral uh, applications. Um, and so what this means is that applications will come and go, they'll be scaled up, they'll be scaled down. Uh, and the IP addresses associated with those workloads uh, is also changing dynamically um, as, the, as the requirements of the environment change. Um, so then the, the, the question here is, is how does an application discover the peers that it needs to be able to communicate with uh, to get its work done? And so you could imagine the application one uh, just discovers directly application two, the IP addresses, you know, 10, 1, 11, 10, 1, 12, and so on. And every time you add a new application to uh, instance in your cluster, then you inform app one about this uh, application. Um, and as you scale up, basically you end up telling every application in your environment about every other application. And that happens upon each scale up and down event, right? Um, so the way that you, you solve this problem is not necessarily a new kind of uh, way to solve this, but you use uh, virtual IP addressing. So we, we define an IP address that uh, represents the service that's hosted by app two in this case. Uh, and then this makes it, makes it much simpler for app one to be able to connect and, and uh, get its work done because it just connects out to this one IP address. App one doesn't need to be made aware about the, the different instances of app two uh, that are uh, happening in the background. Uh, but then the networking layer then translates those requests to the service IP to the backend IPs to ensure the delivery to those backends. So today, Kubernetes uh, implements this uh, using kernel technologies such as IP tables uh, or IPVS, and um, uh, this has an impact on on how the uh, performance of this uh, uh, this sort of solution uh, works, right? So how we choose to implement the the networking layer of the service translation uh, is quite important. So if you look at uh, the way Kubeproxy uses IP tables to implement this. Uh, it basically just has a linear list of all the different services uh, that uh, that exist in the cluster. So if you have 10,000 services, there's 10,000 rules in this uh, list. And so when an application wants to connect out to this uh, service destination, uh, for each packet that's running through the system, it's going to then uh, look through each of those services uh, until it finds the service that it's actually trying to connect to. And only then it's going to be able to translate that service IP address uh, to the uh, the actual backend that backs that service. Um, so, you know, what happens when you scale up to hundreds or thousands of services? Then, worst case, for every packet that's going through the system, you go through all these irrelevant services first just to be able to find the one uh, that you want. And not only that, actually, in the IP tables implementation, if you want to change just one of those services, what you have to do is take this entire list, uh, dump this into user space, add an additional service into that list, and then replace the entire list back into the kernel. So this doesn't seem um, such a, a great implementation, but you know it's relatively naive, but it was also designed in the, in the 1990s, right? So that quote that I uh, had from the IP tables maintainers in the, in, the, in the beginning was, yeah, I mean, it was good enough for a while. Um, but now we need something radically different. So how does Cilium change this? So Cilium uses eBPF to implement the, the same functionality uh, using hash tables. So instead of iterating through all of the different services, including perhaps a range of irrelevant services, we can immediately just hash the uh, IP address of the service and go directly to a backend. So um, this makes uh, the lookup much more efficient. It's just one hash table uh, lookup and one map lookup to find the backend. Uh, and there's even uh, possibilities to do this uh, per CPU. So even if multiple CPUs are trying to look up the same backends at once, uh, you don't have contention between those different C uh, CPUs. Uh, but more interestingly even than this, so we can make this more efficient uh, at a per packet level, uh, but we can even reevaluate the question of why are we running this logic on every single packet? Um, so when the application connects to the service, we know that it's trying to connect to uh, the specific virtual IP address. Um, but perhaps we could reduce the number of times that we have to perform this uh, virtual service translation um, and uh, improve the efficiency of the system overall. So why do we actually do that? Um, and why, why would we translate this uh, these virtual addresses once per packet? So the basic idea is that well, IP addresses live at the IP layer. Uh, and so typically uh, what the app application is trying to do is first it connects to some peer. 
Um, and then it starts to form messages and it wants to send these messages to the peer. Uh, and then because of uh, historic reasons about how networking works, we split these, these messages up into many little packets. And so uh, for each of these, basically the application is sending this uh, traffic through the sockets, through the TCP layer, down to the IP layer. And down at this IP layer, then uh, we implement this you know, IP tables logic and so on that allows uh, this virtual IP service translation to occur per packet. So this is great. It gets the uh, functionality of the, the service discovery and, and being able to um, avoid having app one learn about you know, every single uh, instance of app two in the cluster. Um, but it is happening awful often, right? So if that application is sending many messages, then it's sending an order of magnitude more uh, packets. Uh, and for each of those, we're doing some amount of work to ensure uh, that the application is able to connect to the peer. So how does eBPF allow us to rethink this entire uh, problem space? So, I mean, broadly, like the, the problem with the previous situation is that there are potentially many, many events happening uh, like once per packet. But when the application actually tries to connect to this virtual IP address, it's simply trying to connect to this IP address at the socket layer. So eBPF is not restricted to just running at the IP layer in the system. It has event hooks all over the place, and that includes at the socket layer. So with eBPF-based events at the connect call, for instance, we can actually implement the service translation when the app connects to that destination. And that happens just once per connection. So then there's no per message cost and there's no per packet cost either. So this basically makes uh, the Cilium implementation of this virtual IP service translation orders of magnitude faster. So we can make this logic that executes upon these events more efficient just by using better mechanisms to implement those, those logics, right? Implement the, the logic where it makes sense to, to implement it. So this principle applies to other areas. Um, it's not just the performance aspect, um, but it certainly uh, is improved by using EPF as a basis. So next we're gonna take a look at uh, security. So in security, um, if we look at how you build a uh, networking firewall um, and we want to define a policy or you know, firewall rules that determine which applications in my environment are allowed to connect to one another, um, how would I go about this? So each application in the environment has an IP address. And so if I just keep track of every single application in my environment that I want to talk to, and I write that I, uh, application's IP address down in a policy, um, then I think you know, it should be good. We just have to track all of those IP addresses for this particular app and update our policies. And okay, well, when you connect to a new uh, peer, then you need to learn about that IP address and you need to also write that down in the policy. Uh, and then if you're exposing a service, well, uh, I suppose you have to also understand uh, which uh, users of your service are going to attempt to access you. And so there's the ingress policy side. So perhaps you'll uh, keep track of those IP addresses as well. Um, and then, well, okay, in an ephemeral kind of environment in cloud native, when someone redeploys their app, well, that may involve new IP addresses. So of course we have to update the policy there uh, as well. So that's the thing. What's happening here is that we're ascribing meaning to these IP addresses. And the thing is about IP addresses is they're, they're simply a location in the network where an application is running. However, in a cloud native environment with ephemeral applications coming and going, the IP address at one point in time may represent one particular app. And then five minutes later, when that application is scaled down, perhaps another application is scaled up, that same IP address can have an entirely different security posture. So if we're writing policies uh, you know, deep in the, in the networking layer based upon directly IP addresses, then uh, Basically, we're, we're potentially getting into a situation where we, we have to both handle a huge number of events in the system uh, in order to keep that uh, security policy accurate at any given point in time. Um, but also, we need to update that policy, uh, all those, uh, ju just that uh, frequently as well. And the thing is that this is not really reflecting the intent of the network policy. The intent is not to say, can my application attach, uh, connect to this location? It's trying to say, can my application connect to this other particular application or the, this domain perhaps? 
So how can we use eBPF to get a deeper understanding of who it is that we're connecting to? Because we don't really want to determine the policy based on where the app is. We want to determine the policy based on who that app is. And so while an IP-based uh, system can, can certainly uh, look into the TCP IP stack and, and perhaps um, determine policy directly based on IPs, uh, eBPF allows us to introspect a range of different points in the kernel to be able to associate uh, the kind of base identity of, of that application uh, with, with the policy and then enforce the policy based on that identity. So this can happen at the IP layer, certainly. It can happen at the socket layer, as we uh, briefly discussed in the networking section. Uh, but it can also use the uh, underlying IDs that are uh, representing the container uh, in the kernel space. So for instance, C groups and, and namespaces. And we can take this further with you know, cryptographic identities via, uh, via Spiffy or uh, provenance build IDs um, and so on. So instead of enforcing policy just on where the application happens to be residing, like in the cluster at this point in time, we can tie the security policy to this much deeper understanding of the identity of that app application. So what that allows us to do is, is improve the security posture of the applications uh, using eBPF. So how can Cilium do this? So what Cilium does is uh, Cilium runs as an agent on each node in the cluster, and it runs before the applications actually uh, run. And so when it receives uh, a notification that this uh, application has been created on a given node in the cluster, it can then associate the identity with that workload uh, as the container is being created, but before the application workload actually runs. And so uh, by assigning these uh, identities to these applications and sharing those between each node in the cluster via some sort of data store like the Kubernetes API or etcd, uh, then every node in the cluster can have a sense of the identities of applications that are running in the cluster. So then let's say that the front end here uh, wants to connect to the back end. As the front end sends traffic out from its own pod, Cilium using eBPF attaches the identity to that uh, uh, application traffic, and she injects it into the uh, uh, into the packet content as it's transferred uh, between nodes. And then at the destination, uh, using eBPF, we can then verify the identity of that, uh, that traffic, where it came from, and then also implement a policy for the backend to say, well, uh, does the backend allow requests from this app with this identity? Uh, and if so, yes, we can allow the traffic into the uh, backend pod, and if not, then we can choose what to do with that, but perhaps drop that, that traffic. And so this works certainly for uh, traffic within the cluster, um, but we can also take this even further by uh, getting insights into the DNS traffic that's going through the system. And so we, uh, using eBPF, we can um, take a look at the uh, DNS traffic. So when the front end attempts to connect out to mydomain.io, uh, first, it will attempt to resolve the DNS name for that IP address. And so using eBPF, we can monitor uh, those DNS requests and responses. And then by gathering that information uh, as it is, uh, uh, as, it, as the application attempts to learn what the IP address of that uh, peer is, uh, we can then uh, do enforcement based on that knowledge uh, subsequently. So, so the from a user perspective, what we say is allow this application to connect to, to mydomain.io or any subdomain underneath, underneath that. And then Cilium as a network layer then tracks all of the information that is necessary to be able to implement the, the allow for the traffic that actually connects to that destination uh, at the IP layer. So in summary, we kind of, we go from this world where instead of defining policies in terms of locations of where applications happen to be living at this point in time, uh, to suddenly understanding much more deeply what are the uh, aspects of that application and, um, and how we can, and then we can write policies that then enforce based on that additional information. Uh, and it doesn't have to stop there either because um, it, we can simplify some other workflows in terms of, uh, say, forensics or uh, risk, uh, threat assessments and so on, uh, by uh, tying together that kind of cloud native understanding of the identity of the application with the IP address when we're emitting events from the system. 
So rather than having a, a situation where you emit events from the system based on IP addresses, and then you separately have to look up in an information base, what is the association of this IP address to a particular application at a particular point in time, uh, and then do that for all the various different other IP addresses that you see in these events that are being emitted from the system. Uh, instead, you can have all of this information tied together in the event as it's being emitted uh, directly out, out from Selenium. And this is also relevant, of course, not only for security, but also for observability. Now, observability is a, a big space. There's a lot of different aspects. Um, so I'm going to focus on just, just one aspect of how Cilium uh, makes it easier to understand the network flows that are going on in your system. Um, so what happens when we want to observe network flows in a cloud-native kind of an environment? So if you've debugged a network in the last 20 to 30 years, you've probably used TCP dump. Uh, the ancestor of eBPF, the Berkeley packet filter even started there. Um, and you know, I love TCP dump, I love Wireshark. They're great tools to be able to dissect the traffic and understand the protocols of uh, things that are, are flowing through or, or grabbing captures of, of information, uh, of network flow information uh, in system. Uh, but in a cloud native environment, again, we have this problem where uh, we're attempting to associate these IP addresses with actual applications that are running in our cluster. And it can be very difficult to, to perform this kind of uh, uh, correlation. So if we were to say account for the developments in the cloud native space in the last five years, uh, well, what would we add? Well, we'd try to add some sort of understanding about uh, containers or pods. And so that's what we did. Uh, so with Hubble, basically we, use those deep insights that we understood from the identity, and as I discussed in the previous section, uh, and associate that identity with the flows that are being emitted from the data path. So in this case, uh, on the uh, left-hand side here, we have like the X-Wing pod uh, attempts to make a DNS request. And we can see that because it says default slash X-Wing. So it's the default uh, namespace, the X-Wing uh, application, and it's connecting to the kube system core DNS uh, application. Uh, and then subsequently, we can see the HTTPS uh, request going out. We can see the TCP flags and so on. We can see uh, domain names that the application is trying to connect to. And not only that, so we can uh, gain in insights in terms of uh, the identity of those applications and, and the uh, perhaps the DNS names and so on associated with the, the peers outside the cluster. Uh, but even also Cilium's own uh, reasoning about how it handles the traffic uh, can be seen as well. So the very last uh, flow there, we can see the X-Wing attempts to uh, make a pass by the Death Star, uh, but the policy uh, in the Cilium is denying this traffic. And so we can see from the Cilium output that this traffic was denied due to policy. Uh, and we can see the direction and, and the pods involved in that. So this can be very useful also for debugging uh, policy problems and understanding uh, the policy posture of your applications. So what's Hubble? Well, Hubble is the uh, part of Cilium that allows you to do all of this. So Hubble also runs co-located on, on each node in the, in the cluster, uh, along with Cilium, to be able to observe the events that are going on in the system. And it provides relays uh, and a, a UI uh, to export uh, all of that kind of network flow data into the tooling um, that, that you can use this. This includes uh, metrics and so on. So what can you do with that? Uh, so there's basics, just like TCP dump, you could go into a, uh, into a node and you can start to debug that, but you start to get the uh, additional uh, cloud native um, information like, like pod names and so on. Uh, but additionally, we can start to do that not just on one node, but do it as a cluster wide operation. And so you can start to pull the, the flow data that's happening across the entire cluster. Uh, and then export those flow insights into centralized stores. We can do analysis. We can visualize the applications and then feed all that information back into your workflows. So you can debug, why can this service attack, uh, connect to this service? Or why can't this service connect to this other service? And uh, start to understand how the security policies in your environment are uh, impacting your traffic or, or perhaps even uh, either assist writing or even generate the security policies for the applications in your, in your environment. 
So this is the Hubble UI service map, which provides a visualization of the applications and the environment. Um, but not only that, it allows to uh, filter down the network flows that we see in the environment down to relevant flows. So focus on a particular application or find the uh, flows related to a flow that you're, you're interested in. Uh, or even like filter down to specific types of events. So it may be that you uh, often see reset events or maybe uh, tra traffic is often dropped due to policy. And so you can filter down and understand which applications are involved, um, which ones are impacted and, and, and use that to take action and either resolve that uh, you know, policy issue or, or trace down the, the root cause. And not only that, uh, of course, through a nice UI, you can you can click through and say, okay, well, this flow for, between this application and this application, let me double click on that. And then start to get, again, that kind of deeper identity understanding. What are the labels involved in uh, uh, in the the decision that we're uh, around the, the forwarding or, or, or deny of the traffic? And beyond that, uh, it allows us to kind of gather insights into the way that the applications are behaving from a, from a network uh, kind of perspective. Um, so it's, it's not just the uh, forwards or, or drops, which certainly we have that as well, but even stuff like um, you know, statistically gathering which of the top uh, ports being used or understand which applications are attempting to connect outbound and are not receiving any sort of uh, response. Um, and not only this, again, because it's based on identity over time, it's, it's not based on uh, IP addresses. Uh, what this means is that for a given application, uh, even if that application is scaled down, scaled back up, uh, we can correlate the events across those uh, different uh, actual runs of the application uh, together uh, over time. And so that you don't get disruptions in the, uh, the matrix uh, just because the application is restarted or, or perhaps, uh, should, we, should we say, deployed into a, with a new IP address. Um, so it starts to give uh, this, some sort of idea of metrics uh, that were not available uh, before. So to uh, recap, uh, let's revisit the, the agenda. So there's a couple of questions I posed at the start. How does eBPF allow us to rethink the way that we solve problems? And how does eBPF make Cilium a fundamentally better data plane for, for cloud native uh, environments? So first, looking at uh, networking. Uh, so if we look at the history of the of packet networking and the constraints that we had, in general, the, there was a trend towards, you know, you have an application sending, opening a connection and sending messages, and then we cut those messages up into all these uh, separate packets and, and transmit each of those packets on the wire. And then over time, uh, the industry, we, we built up these middle boxes that then process uh, those packets and implement, you know, useful mechanisms like virtual IP addressing implementing it for each of those packets in the system. And then over time, uh, those, uh, fu that functionality was moved more and more to uh, the, the endpoints, to, to the source, for instance, of, uh, of that traffic. And so uh, now, given that the uh, application is actually correlate, uh, is, is co-located with the, um, the networking functionality, we can start to rethink the way that we implement the, that, uh, that functionality. So rather than actually looking at each individual packet and then executing logic to implement the, the virtual IP for each one of those packets, we can now look at the socket layer and just say, okay, when this application attempts to connect to a, a peer, uh, we can perform that translation just once. So um, orders of magnitude faster. And at the same time, we're actually able to retain the illusion for the application that the application doesn't need to know about all of these other peers in the cluster. It's the networking layer that's providing this, but it's doing this in a much more uh, efficient way. Um, so this allows us it to be much faster and also much simpler. In terms of security, if you start from a kind of a straightforward uh, firewall and kind of perspective, you say, okay, well, we want to ascribe certain properties to, to parts of the IP range. And, and we say, okay, well, as you track these different IPs, as they're spun up, as applications and workloads are created uh, in the uh, cluster, um, then you know this, this can work for a while, um, as long as your policy actually keeps up with the use of those addresses. Um, but as the uh, containers and, and cloud functions and so on 
kind of accelerate this trend of ephemeral workloads where IP addresses are actually reused for different purposes and have different security properties over time, uh, this becomes increasingly difficult. So rather than building our network policy decisions directly based on the IP addresses and what those IP addresses or those locations uh, mean, we want to dig deep into what the actual identity of that application is and then start to write the policy based upon that identity. Using eBPF, we can start to work various different kernel structures that underlie the mechanisms that underlie this, uh, these systems, uh, such as the con container uh, mechanisms and, of course, the, the networking stack as well. Uh, and that allows us to build up a, a, a much more comprehensive idea of the, the identity of that application. Uh, So in terms of observability, um, so you know industry standard for debugging your your environment, of course TCP DOM. But what we can do, that, you know, is is start to integrate additional knowledge and insight about the environment into the events that are occurring in the system. And again, this kind of deeper notion of identity helps here because we can associate a bunch of this other uh, metadata that's about each of those events that's happening in the system to those events as they're being emitted from the environment. So that when you want to try and correlate the events, uh, rather than having to have to, on one hand, look at the IP addresses and on the other hand, look at various different um, you know, uh, listings of pods and somehow try to reason about which uh, of these pieces of information are tied together. Instead, each event actually contains all of the information that you need to be able to debug uh, these uh, environments. And at the same time, we can actually do this potentially more efficiently because we can aggregate the uh, the events at the at the right layer. Um, so we spend less CPU cycles trying to perform this um, uh, this observability functionality, um, and that translates into more CPU cycles you can spend on your actual workload. So this talk has focused primarily around Cilium and, and some of the use cases uh, that it has for eBPF. Um, so we've leveraged that power of eBPF to, to solve various different crucial problems that are, are common in cloud native uh, environments. Uh, now to, to actually make this talk into a kind of a manageable size, I had to just pick a couple of these ideas. But throughout Cilium, we have various different areas where you can see this pattern where eBPF allows us to rethink the way that we would actually build this networking functionality um, where it's deep in the kind of IP layers and so on of the networking step or all the way up at uh, service mesh. And so we can build a more efficient data plane with better insight into the uh, events that are actually happening in the system. So with that, I'll uh, wrap this up. Uh, so this concludes our series on how the Hive came to be. Uh, if you're interested in uh, hands-on labs, uh, then we have a host of resources available here uh, you can follow the links of the QR codes uh, to find out more. And we also have the uh, eBPF Summit coming up on the 28th and 29th of September. Um, so we have a host of interesting uh, speakers there, including the co-creators of eBPF. Uh, they'll be hosted by Liz, Tracy, and Duffy. And uh, we do actually have a full schedule uh, available on the website now. So if you go to eppf.io, uh, then you can find out. I think we have uh, maybe four different tracks. We have a couple of CTFs. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And you can join the uh, watch parties. So we have, I think, four watch parties available now. And uh, you can join us and experience the summit together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe. That was awesome. There have been a lot of questions in the background. I did my very best to answer them. But for all the more deep dive technical stuff, I, of course, uh, need you. So let's take it from the top to the bottom in the Q&A section. It was uh, Vira Kuma asked, since many CNI uses IP tables, we are familiar with below commands to trace the path between source and destination. And it's an IP tables command uh, dash n dash t not dash capital L and then, for example, cube services. And the question is, do we have similar commands for eBPF here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so inside the, the Cilium pod, there is this uh, Cilium CLI which there you can use uh, the Cilium service list and it'll actually list the various different services that exist on the system. Uh, and alongside it will list the various different backends that those services will translate to. So I think that's a, it'll be in a different, slightly different uh, format. It's kind of more of a table, um, but it's exactly the same sort of uh, information.
Oh, awesome. Thank you. And then Sanju asks, does Cilium Network policy have attributes that can be set based on L7 headers that can be looked up and enforcement based on and enforced based on those? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Um, so Cilium does have some L7 uh, uh, header support. Uh, so not only for HTTP, but uh, Kafka and, and a few other uh, protocols as well. Um, so we have getting started guides on the uh, docs.cilium.io website, um, which will actually walk you through uh, some of these workflows. And so uh, we have a fun kind of Star Wars demo uh, where uh, the X-Wing is trying to um, blow up the uh, the Death Star and uh, we can implement a policy that will uh, will foil the uh, the Rebels plans. So uh, I encourage you to check that out. It's, it's quite fun. Yeah. Very good. Um, by the way, also the on icfadin.com slash labs, you find interactive hands-on labs where one, there is a network policy lab, and I'm pretty sure this also goes into the very same example and uh, very, very same easy. details. And there's also a Cilium OSS getting started lab, which I think is picking up the network, uh, the Star Wars theme here. Another question in the Q&A is uh, do, from Virakuma, do we have any document to, to refer how the eBPF hatching lookup happens and how it reduces the CPO, uh, CPU load? Um, I wasn't able to quickly find, I, I think there was something um, which is not too much into the kernel code, but I thought i will ask you if, if you have a link handy or if you can pinpoint at least to some good source. Okay, yeah. So um, I, I think the, the core principle here actually um, is uh, the, a, a general computer science principle of the, the hash table lookup, um, which is effectively that if you have um, a, a table with a bunch of elements that you can, you can ideally index, uh, you can do a small amount of computation on, uh, say, an IP address, for instance, and turn that into an index in this array, uh, and then go directly with a small amount of computation to this element in this array. And then that's where, where our service backends will, will actually be. Um, I think if you look up, yeah, hash table and maybe uh, O1 or big O uh, notation, then you, you may find some resources around um, how that is, is much faster than um, actually iterating through the various different yeah, elements. Thank you very much. Um, table. Yeah, and there's, um... There is one from James. I hope you can still hear me because I just got the message that my internet connection is unstable. James asks, is each Cilium agent um, is each Cilium agent enforcing this network policies on its node or is there a controller somewhere handling this? Yeah, so Cilium runs on each node in the cluster uh, and it actually has uh, control plane and data plane separation. So the control plane and, and Cilium talks to Kubernetes and it understands understands the intent of the policy and so on. And then it generates BPF logic that then runs in the kernel. Uh, so one of the benefits of this is that when the Cilium agent uh, you know, goes away for some reason, uh, the, the logic will actually continue to forward in, in, in the uh, data plane. So that means you can enforce policies even if the agent is not running. Very good. Um, then a short question, does TCP dump uses eBPF? I think this goes back to when you mentioned TCP dump. Yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is actually a super interesting question. So, so originally, certainly not. Um, I, I think technically, I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think today in the Linux kernel, all of the uh, TCP dump BPF logic actually gets translated into eBPF. Uh, but it actually, it's, it's much older and it doesn't have as, uh, as rich a set of functionality in terms of the insights you can get. Very good, thank you. And last question for now, where does Cilium store the hash table? Um, is it on its CD or on the node? I, I think you mentioned when you mentioned the kernel, but if you could go into a little bit more detail here for a second. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I think that's probably related to the, to the uh, service translation uh, logic. Uh, so in that case, it's, it's happening in, inside the kernel. So as your application sends traffic and that goes through the kernel, uh, that traffic will then immediately hit this hash table that's in memory on the node. And so this allows us to actually uh, do this very, very efficiently. Um, so sort of, I guess, order of kind of nanoseconds rather than having to have to go over the network to etcd to be able to make this, uh, this query. Great. Thank you for answering all the questions. And to, to the audience, of course, thank you for asking all these interesting questions. That was awesome. And with this, we're done. Thanks again for everyone, everyone participating. If you're interested in the first two sessions, feel free to check out isofedit.com slash events where you will find them. Keyword here is the, how the hive came to be. And 
with this, I wish you wherever you are a nice day, nice evening, nice night or nice morning. And Joe again, thanks for the presentation and for everything here. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone.